Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. And we've got a treat today. Joining us is intrepid reporter Alex Norshoff from Filter. How's it going, Alex? Hey, how are you? Very good, very good. I'm happy to have you on the show because, quite frankly, as from one journalist to another, we steal your stuff all the time. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so fill our audience in who don't know who you are, some of your background. Maybe just quickly start with Filter, dive into some background, and then we'll obviously we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about vaping and your coverage. Okay, cool. So I've been at Filter since March, I want to say. Um, all sort of blurs together. Um, primarily writing about vaping and tobacco harm reduction. I work three days a week, that's usually two of my days, and then the other day is some unrelated thing about drug policy. And then prior to that, um, I had been a staff writer at Vice, which is kind of where I started covering vaping. It's not kind of where I started covering vaping, it is where I started covering vaping. Um, and I did that for about two years, and I was laid off during the pandemic in a May of, yeah, last year. So it's been basically a year, and I've been at Filter since March. So character, characterize for us what the coverage is on Filter. I mean, I don't want to say it, but it is fairly, you know, pro-vaping, is it not? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a harm reduction-centered website, so um, by its nature it is. But yeah, I mean, it's not, um, it's weird because I don't think it's necessarily um, pro anything. I would say it's more just like, at least my approach is that that's the most logical perspective to have so your background in journalism you know before vaping coverage i guess then advice i mean were you trained in journalism had you worked at other rags uh i mean honestly not really i had um i majored in english and uh, i went to school in boston at boston university um and then i sort of just putzed around new york city um you know sort of daydreaming about writing a novel or something and then um you know i need to i need money so I slowly started worming my way into that field, but I, to be honest with you, I had no real aspirations to do so. Um, I became an assistant at the New York Times um, pretty early on, like 2014, and I had that job. I was working at nights on the international desk. I had that job for about a year and a half, and then um, I couldn't really take the hours anymore. So uh, I took a job copy editing Vice's print magazine, um, which at that time was monthly. And then after that sort of weaseled my way into being a staff writer where I kind of covered whatever. Um, and then slowly started uh, building a beat around mainly drugs and labor. And then eventually because vaping exploded, um, specifically vaping. So back when you were with Vice, how would you characterize their frame, the angle that they had towards vaping? Um, I mean, if you, you totally on, honestly, like I, uh, it was me. So I, I, it, it had, there was no, like, um, there's no real pushback or anything like that, but, um, and I haven't been on there. I haven't clicked on their website, honestly, since I've been laid off, but yeah, I mean, it, there's a direct, there's a direct line between me being there and them kind of covering it aggressively. Um, I will say though, they, I was at a time when they were kind of somebody new had become in charge and they were really pushing people to sort of lean into like niches, like carving lanes that other places weren't doing. Um, and I found that, um, this isn't the reason I covered necessarily, but I found it a pretty easy one to get into because everybody else seems so colossally um, wrong for so long. Either they were wrong as reporters. What else, What were they wrong about? Well, I mean, I think it became, at least for me, I mean, I smoked for a long time. So, I mean, I have a sort of um, background in why nicotine's great, let's say. Uh, but at the time, I forget what it was. I mean, it was that summer. So I guess it was the summer of 2019. It was kind of when Jewel was really kind of getting roasted. Um, and Ivali had happened. Um, and everyone was just freaking out. Um, and it seemed to me if you just spent a little bit of time, you know, reading and talking to the people who like knew what they were talking about, that it quickly seemed like a drug panic to me. Um, and then that's kind of what I ran with. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, there's, there's few scenarios that I can think of where it's just like, I knew I was going to be right. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, and like, as time has gone on, that's been the case, you know? 
uh, at the top end here of the uh, interview, I'd like to do a kind of a bullet list that we can hit. So first of all, based on your reporting at Filter now and previously with Vice, but based on your rep- reporting, is the science on vaping settled? Yes and no. I mean, no one, I mean, there's a there's a fair thing to say that no one knows the long-term consequences, sure. But yeah, I mean, it's clearly much, 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 much safer than uh, smoking cigarettes, yes. And then what does uh, the science say about nicotine vaping products with regards to safety and efficacy? Yeah, I mean, clearly it's a very, very um, successful way to get people to stop smoking. And not only stop smoking, but still be able to enjoy nicotine in a less harmful manner, which I think is often... Um, something that gets lost, right? I mean, people like to talk about it being a sort of off-ramp from smoking, which it is, but then it also leaves out the fact that, you know, a lot of people just want to be able to use nicotine. Um, And I I have no problem with that, obviously. Um, But I think that tends to get shrouded with, like, this idea that everybody should, their goal should be to quit, when um, I don't necessarily think that's at least everybody's intention. So there is something enjoyable, then, about using nicotine. Yeah, I mean, I think that's indisputable. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Right. It's a huge, I mean, it's a huge problem, so of course it is, right? So it's one thing then to, um, you know, say as regulators and so forth, to push the population to get off of smoking, but there wasn't getting off of nicotine. That wasn't a part of the deal. No, I mean, and the one way to look at this is how great a drug nicotine is, right? I mean, it's a ben- relatively benign substance that people will, do whatever essentially to have right and it's um not causing and there's a way to use it and not engage in really any kind of harm to yourself or even others then um what's the big deal other than i'm sure we'll get to it but this sort of you know kid problem so the other part of that question was whether or not they're safe yeah they're much safer than smoking that's what i mean it's a low bar it's a low bar to clear though um i think the narrative is going to shift very soon once um the FDA here finally starts approving these pre-market tobacco applications and essentially saying that they are um, safer. I mean, because I can say this all I want, you can say it all you want, but no one's, um, I think the vast majority of the public are not going to take it seriously until the government says that's the case. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And so then with regards to the FDA and the PMTA process, uh, based on your reporting, it sound, you sound a little hopeful, and you do in your writing, that there may actually be products that get approved. Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to I think that's gonna be true. Um, I don't know if you listened to the e-cigarette summit the other day, but um, two people from the FDA had, two high-ranking members of the FDA had spoken. Um, and it was the first time, really, that I had heard sort of, I mean, they were very kind of careful and scripted in what they were saying, but in no way, shape or form, did they say there's going to be like full scale prohibition or anything like that. Um, or even they didn't dismiss the idea that there would be some flavors, right? Um, they seem to be accepting that the reality is going to be that there's going to be a regulated market. If that regulated market is seven companies that they can control, I don't know. That's probably the case, but um, we'll see. But in no way did I get the sense that, because for a while you did kind of think they were just going to be like, we're banning all of these things. Um, I really, really, really don't think that's true. Correct me if I'm wrong. The idea here is that if FDA does approve some products under a PMTA process, that that will actually go come with some kind of a statement towards efficacy and potentially reduced risk. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it has to, because I mean, approving them basically i forget the exact wording right but it's appropriate for the protection of public health right which i mean just essentially by that definition implies that it's safer right um so yeah i mean and i get this and i get the sense too because so much misinformation has been swirling around for so long that they're not just gonna approve these products and not make some kind of statement about the continuum of risk or whatever they're gonna have to explain to a relatively misinformed public um, why this is the new reality. Because I think like me or you could think like this has been a long time coming or whatever. But I think for most people who don't pay attention to this every day, uh, that they're going to be sort of shocked. Let me ask you uh, specifically, is there a war on vaping or are we just imagining it? 
you know, I thought I thought there was for a long time. Uh, I'm not going to pretend there's not um, very antagonistic people out there. Um, but I don't think um, I don't the vaping's not going to I do think there's going to be a regulated market very soon. Right. Um, but that's not going to stop people like Michael Bloomberg or the campaign for tobacco free kids or you know, the Westchester moms in charge of PAVE or whatever from sort of clamoring that um, vaping needs to be stopped. And then they'll just move on to whatever the next thing is. I mean, I saw today they were, uh, PAVE specifically was tweeting about melatonin diffusers or something. Um, so, you know, it's just a matter, it's just, it's just going to be one thing after another. So, I mean, yeah, the war will continue in that way. And Bloomberg obviously has a very abstinence only approach. But in terms of, like vaping disappearing off the face of the earth or people not having access to these products, at least here. Um, I'm pretty optimistic they're going to be around um, with the government's approval. Now, that that being said, I don't think every company is going to get approved and it's not going to look like it did five years ago and many businesses are going to shut down. But it's not a, a complete assault, if that makes sense. When you're looking at, what was it, 11,000 vape shops sure. across the country, many of them making their own, you know, in-house juice. I mean, you would have to think that much of those businesses might be truly in jeopardy. From my understanding, the FDA is going to seemingly approve the biggest players first, right? I mean, they're supposed to allegedly have them all sort of looked at by September 2021 or whatever, but that seems completely impossible and there's like millions of applications. So, um, I don't, I just don't know. Um, but if they're, you know, if the news is good in September, which I expect it to be, um, it might not necessarily spell doom for everybody, but you know, all there's a bunch of other things that have already sort of screwed everybody, get the pact act, whatever. Um, to the point where the industry is going to look very different, no matter kind of what the FDA ends up doing you're a reporter just remind everybody right. you're not you know an insider advocacy dude or something no. like that but uh, your perspective though is, is got a lot of value and you certainly have a lot of sources uh for your reporting now with flavor bans i mean these are happening at the state level i mean right. what do we know in terms of fda comes out and says all right you know these seven or ten companies whatever these products they work hey look at this mango part of what we've cleared was there any way that is anybody talking and discussing about how you know fda action at the federal level would impact some of these onerous uh restrictions at the state level yeah that's a good question i don't have an answer to but i mean i just reported on uh which is which kind of went around this study out of san francisco not out of San Francisco, but about San Francisco, that was basically saying, or implying at least, that the flavor ban there led to an increase in teen smoking, right? And then there was another study out of uh, somebody at Brown, and then I think Harvard, who had basically said that the kids vaping would have otherwise been smoking cigarettes anyway, meaning that it seems that like one thing after another is showing that these policies are not working and have incredibly unintended consequences to the point that they're doing exactly what they're meant not to do right which is increase smoking um if that doesn't get people <laughs> to change their minds on the state level i don't really know what um else you can do um so yeah i'm not necessarily optimistic the states are going to change their mind but it's also hard to say because i don't know what the fda is going to do and what flavors they're going to approve um, there's obviously going to be massive marketing restrictions, but even that, I don't know what that even looks like yet. Um, though I, I'm excited to finally get some clarity because it's going to be a going to be a fun new chapter to this whole thing. So, with the filter, you mentioned you know you're putting what two two days a week, I guess, against uh, tobacco harm reduction. Where does the support come within the organization and so forth for this coverage? Uh, so, I mean, I was hired explicitly in march to write about tobacco harm reduction i don't know i don't know exactly um why that was the case but i mean filter does have full disclosure um industry funding right so i mean and funding from elsewhere as well and obviously there's an editorial independence policy but i mean that's the kind of ironic thing is that you're either the people 
who tend to pay me to write for these things tend to be people in the industry, right? So it's very easy to be accused of, you know, being a sort of chill. And then the other side is, um, you know, um, Michael Bloomberg types. So there's, there's really no, um, in between, if that makes any sense. So the point where I was like, I still want to keep writing about this, uh, is this even like worth, you know, doing? And it's like, I think the answer is yes, but the only way to do so is to go the route I kind of just described earlier. Right. Well, pick a side. Yeah. I mean, to a degree, sure. I mean, and it's not even like, you know, if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't, you know, like, um, but it's so easy to, and I mean, I'm sure you've seen these arguments levied from sort of absolute prohibitionists at people even relatively involved with a tobacco company. I mean, even when I was at Vice, they had some sort of weird deal with PMI that I did not know about that occurred abroad. Um, and, you know, people at the University of California, San Francisco, just like wouldn't speak to me because they were saying that Philip Morris was dictating my coverage. And I, there was, I, I didn't speak to, um, I have spoken to people at Philip Morris, obviously, as I've been reporting, but in no way were they influencing my car. I didn't even know the deal existed, you know? Yeah. And I believe it's through the foundation for smoke free world, right? So they have a definite they're firewall. All, they, are, they are, they are a large funder of filter. Yeah. If the people who were concerned about where the funding came from just, you know, showed 1% of the same concern that government funding could present a yeah, problem, or, you know, or yeah. nonprofit health group funding could present a problem. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, you want to zoom out entirely. I mean, it's at the end of the day, right? I mean, this is what people tend to frame this whole thing as it's the tobacco industry versus, you know, Michael Bloomberg, right? Um, it's not an ideal scenario, obviously. Um, but I'm, I don't, I'm not going to fix wealth inequality anytime soon. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the best I can do is report as accurately and fairly as possible. I, I I'm not going to solve, you know, the world's philanthropy, philanthropy problem rather like, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, there's just nothing. It's just the reality we have to live in. I think what might be the cultural, uh, the thing operating at the cultural level that drives the anti-vaping movement. Well, I mean, I think one thing, which isn't exactly an answer to your question, but I think one thing I have that maybe like an older reporter doesn't have is I don't really have the collective memory of the tobacco companies being really evil. Right. So, you know, I think I was four or something when they were nine, whatever, you know what I mean? That kind of age when they were, you know, dragged through Congress and lied. And then we all know the story. Cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no. And again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. So I'm a little more not unskeptical of them, but uh, I'm a little more understanding that they have to be radically transparent. Um, and it's in their interest to sell products that will keep people alive longer. I mean, obviously. Um, I don't, I don't know if, you know, somebody older than me is able to sort of divorce themselves from defeating big tobacco, right? Which is, I think it's a huge problem, not only in the media, let's say, but also all of these warriors, these ardent warriors, like a Stan Glantz type person who, you know, even in the best case scenario, right? He's, a, you know, I think he kind of means what he says and he really wants to defeat big tobacco right um but is unable to have any sort of nuanced perspective on the matter because i think he he still is in the these these like ingrained trenches that he was in for decades and can't get out of them and like honestly i don't know if you could ever convince somebody like that that this is what's the new reality right i mean they might just need to stop talking 
So you, <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Glantz. I, one of the questions I you know had on my list to ask you, which was yeah. whether or not the science around vaping is corrupted. And you know, normally when I ask that question, people are thinking of Dr. Glantz. Yeah, I mean, you know, with somebody like him, I mean, I think it's pretty clear it's it's pretty clear he, he knows what he wants the result to be, right? Um, and I think that's what you see. I think you're referencing the heart, heart attack uh, study that he had done that was retracted. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he wants vaping to be terrible um, and cause all kinds of problems. Um, and like I said, I, I don't know why that is other than the fact that I think it's just that's his enemy, right? It's this sort of very easy foe to, you know, point your gun at. What strikes me is, is that when I, when I try to figure out why it is tobacco control is so out of control, and, and why, you know, the abstinence only people are just so out of control is because that maybe vaping itself is the unintended consequence of the smash down on smoking. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, you know, like the more I deal with this too, the more I'm like, they really are, um, I'm talking specifically about prohibitionists. Um, it does seem almost like a religion in a way, right? Like, where you can't really, they just, we're so puritanical, especially here, uh, that we do, we can't understand why anybody would want to alter their state even in a such a minor way. Like, it's hard to even explain to somebody what nicotine does. I mean, it's like caffeine, right, almost. Like, it's relatively benign. Um, but I think people who haven't used it um, and don't want to understand why people might want to use it, uh, they just think, like, you know, people would be better off if they just didn't use it. Um, and that's clearly not the case. People want this so badly that they're inventing ways to be able to consume it more safely, right? It's just not going anywhere, no matter how much these people want it to disappear. And then, you know, what is globally, what does the tobacco industry make? Like, trillions of dollars a year, right? Like, to the point where, like, you know, we're not going to live in a society where nicotine just vanishes. And But they just refuse to, I think, accept that. You mentioned global. What, what do you what do you think of the World Health Organization and their approach towards this issue? Yeah, I mean, I don't really understand. That's the most confusing one in a way. Like, in the U.S., especially with like the FDA, I mean, I've kind of come to the conclusion they don't really do anything until they have to. Um, and that being said, I don't think they're going to take a completely idiotic approach to it at the end of the day. Um, with the World Health Organization, I don't. I don't know why they're so, um, and I mean, you know, conspiracy theories abound with Bloomberg's influence and this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very, very dangerous what they're doing, um, especially because, I mean, you know, at a time when we want to look to scientific bodies to give us, you know, good advice um, and they endlessly seem to think that we're not capable of digesting complex information. Um, it's not the, it's not the greatest sign that they're unwilling to budge. Um, despite the fact that there are plenty of examples around the world where vaping and heat not burn products clearly are decreasing smoking rates. Michelle Minton, uh, senior fellow at the competitive enterprise Institute, uh, this just this spring came out yeah. You know, put a fine point on it and said it was a uh, philanthro colonialism that's happening sure. at the global level. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think if you, I wrote a piece about um, India, maybe in I was last summer, before I worked at Filter, I wrote it for Filter, but I was I was freelancing at the time. Um, it was sort of during my laid off period, but um, I mean, they people in India clearly, or the people I spoke to at least, which were mainly consumers, consumer advocates, and then, you know, a couple of, you know, let's say higher echelon consumer advocates, right? Um, yeah, I mean, really do think that they have the right, and they should think this, um, to, you know, to set their own agenda. And I think with somebody like Michael Bloomberg, it's much easier to go into a country like that um, and be able to influence the policy. 
Um, whereas here, there's all sorts of hurdles and obstacles and things that you'd have to clear. Whereas, you know, you go to the Philippines or you go to India or whatever. Um, and it seems pretty easy to at least push the agenda in a, the direction you want it to go. Um, so yes, I'd agree with that assessment. Yeah. And th- this has been said in the interviews that we've done is that it, it comes down to almost that they're saying that these countries are unsophisticated. They don't, they lack the technical skill and understanding and sophistication to adequately uh, regulate these vaping right. products. So the only course they have is to ban them. Right. And then I think, and I think too, that nobody, nobody really listens to whatever reason. I mean, they, they think it's a battle between big tobacco, which has obviously done terrible things in all these countries too. And then Michael Bloomberg, who, you know what he's doing. And then the, the people in the, you know, caught in the sort of crosshairs of it are, you know, consumers who, you know, basically propelled this technology forward and want to be able to still use it. Um, and they're unable to do so. Uh, and I think partly that's because uh, the two loudest voices in this thing are, unfortunately, you know, the tobacco companies and their gigantic moneyed influence, and then Michael Bloomberg and his gigantic moneyed influence. So it's just sort of a pissing match. Um, and everyone, you know, the people just, you know, get left just thrown astray. So Bloomberg, one of uh, his outlets is an organization called The Union that you've written about fill our audience in about that organization. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, they're another one where it's basically like the world health organization where they have pretty stridently, um, said that vaping is, um, dangerous. Right. And that, um, they came out with a, uh, I guess sort of like a laundry list of reasons why, vaping products should be banned in lower to middle income countries, right? So then um, uh, INCA, which we uh, talked about earlier briefly, um, which is just a consumer organization, um, somewhat recently, they released a sort of response to that, basically saying that what we were just talking about, that they have the right to um, lower to middle income countries, LMICs, have the right to sort of set their own agenda and shouldn't be influenced by these very wealthy outside forces, you know, something like the campaign for tobacco free kids where, you know, they start out fighting the tobacco companies. Right. Um, and at the time were perceived as admirable. Um, and then as time goes on and that sort of fight is, you know, at least here somewhat one, right. Um, but they still exist and they still need to exist. So like the next sort of step in their evolution, is to be, to continue the sort of perspective they have, which is bam, 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 get rid of things um, toward vaping, right? Which is to say that the second that, you know, nicotine vaping is, you know, tacitly approved by the FDA, um, they're either going to have to say the FDA is idiotic and can't do their jobs, or they just move on to whatever the next thing they want banned is that loosely has to do with either, you know, vaping or, tobacco or nicotine, whatever, right? So it's like they're going to exist in perpetuity. Um, They'll just, I mean, it's a game of whack-a-mole, you know? Well, as much as that they need vaping to uh, continue on their crusade, I guess we need Bloomberg to continue our reporting. That's also, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the thing too. It's like, you know, in terms of the story, it's, it's, uh, he makes it interesting for sure. Um, and all, all of the characters in this world make that interesting. I mean, that's another reason I'm sort of attracted to it. It is a motley crew of people in a way. I mean, almost from every sort of background you can imagine. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's fascinating talking to people about this because the main thing they all have in common is they don't want to keep smoking cigarettes, you know? Alex, you uh, wrote, why Japan's huge drop in smoking is a story prohibitionists ignore. And you wrote this yeah. for a filter. There is something going on in Japan that's really not cracking through here in the West. Smoking rates dropped, I think, like more than 40 percent, if I remember correctly, in the last five years or so. Right. Um, and that's largely to do with uh, Philip Morris International's IQUIS being introduced into the market. Right. Um, 
So more and more Japanese people are using this. Vaping is essentially still, um, as far as I can tell, it's somewhat confusing, but you really don't seem to be able to vape there. Um, and it's not as if, um, which is an important point that people made to me, it's not as if the Japanese government was encouraging people to stop smoking by means of using this heat not burn product, right? So for the most part, it seems as if consumers just found this product and started using it in droves and then it sunk the cigarette consumption rate uh, to such a point that it makes you think if a government was encouraging people to do this, what would it look like, right? Meaning that it probably would increase even more. Yeah, it could be far more successful as a quit smoking aid, vaping could or heat not burn, say in the US or Canada, if the government's got fully behind it. Right. And then here, I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to say why um, just Iquis is a modified product in the U.S. too. And I, I, I don't have an answer for why it hasn't taken off in such a way, but it could simply be because more people, you know, you're allowed to vape here and people prefer vaping, right? One last question for you. Yeah. Alex, how come you don't want to save the children? Oh, you mean... Uh, well, I mean, a loaded question, but I will answer it. I mean, I think I think kids are going to engage, uh, at least some of them are going to engage in risky behaviors. Um, and I don't think, one, I don't think lying to them works. And then secondly, I don't think these sort of, um, like I said before, these sort of strident, easy to ignore messages um, tend to not work i mean i think it w would be better if we just kind of told them the truth like we told adults which is to say that no one is um encouraging you to take up nicotine if you don't already do so but it's a wild scenario in which um kids think vaping is just as dangerous as cigarettes meaning that and i'll, I'll just say it if uh, kids are using either of these products, we'd much rather them be vaping, right? It, it makes uh, the most sense. Um, and if they're going to be engaging in behaviors, uh, they should choose the safest one. Um, that being said, uh, obviously, I, and I think it's going to happen, the FDA is going to impose tons of restrictions, right? I mean, I think a large reason um, vaping took off the way it did among the youth was because of you know, it's spreading around on social media in very unconstrained ways, which probably had a lot to do with, you know, Jules whole fiasco and how they kind of went off the rails a bit in terms of advertising. But once those restrictions are in, um, and once it's much harder to obtain these products, um, and they still manage to get their hands on these sorts of things, um, yeah, I mean, I leave it as an open question. Just what would you rather them be doing, vaping or smoking?